Hi, everyone. Welcome and happy Wednesday. I hope everyone is having a great time. Uh, welcome to our March Business Bites. We're very glad to have everyone here today, and we're very excited for our super and great panelist discussion today. To introduce myself, my name is Brian Lay from Hannah House, Newport Beach, and I want to personally thank everyone for taking their time out to join us. Um, as a small background, Business Bites is a collaboration between Hannah House and Honest Access. Honest Access is an innovation and consulting firm and Hannah House is a co-working space and cafe located in two locations, one in Palo Alto and one in Newport Beach. Unfortunately, our, our space is closed and during the pandemic, but we continue to operate and provide many insightful events uh, such as Business Bites every month. So follow both of our social media channels to stay updated. We have many new topics for the upcoming year and very excited to welcome all of you to it. Uh, to start off with some housekeeping items, we encourage you all to use the chat feature at the bottom and engage and ask any questions throughout the session. So as a fun start to the session, please go to the chat box below um, and comment where you're tuning in from. We'll love to hear it and see where our audience is coming from. Again, the session is going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel and sent out via email uh, within the next week. Uh, we'll also provide a survey at the end of the session just to get some feedback to improve our future sessions. Uh, with all that being said, um, I would like to hand it over to the amazing Ke Kelly from Honest Access as today's moderator and welcome our amazing panelists for today. So thank you and enjoy the session. Thanks so much, Brian, and thank you to everybody who is here watching us live and anybody who tunes in uh, watching on the recording. I am connecting with you from sunny Newport Beach, California, and looking forward to a time when I can host Hana House Virtual Business Bites from the actual Hana House location with a coffee in hand. Uh, though today I am thrilled to have three panelists uh, joining us from the East Coast. For any of you who had signed up uh, from our last session or, uh, you know, a few days back, uh, you might have noticed that we have a new panelist on today's Virtual Business Bites. Unfortunately, Brock Weatherup, who had been scheduled to join us, had a last-minute conflict, but we are very fortunate that Steve Farbstein, a uh, leadership executive, was able to join us at the last minute, uh, really in the spirit of pivots, uh, we made a pivot on our own talk. So with no further ado, uh, I'm Kelly O'Connell. This is a safe space, so feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We're looking forward to learning from you and growing together as a group. I am going to welcome our panelists, starting with you, Curtis. I would love for you to just give us a quick update regarding your background and tell us a bit about your role and the work that you do day to day. Okay, great. Thanks, Kelly. So uh, I saw someone from IIBA Central Iowa. I don't know if they're still here, but I, I, I know who that is or I know that organization because I used to be a chapter president of, that's the International Institute of Business Analysts. I was a business analyst. Uh, prior to that, a software developer, and prior to that, a lot of things. But but basically, I've weaved that all together these days, my experience with product, agile teams, and rolled it into an innovation practice. And I have a small studio based out of Orlando, Florida, work with a variety of clients, a lot of them in higher education, uh, some in publishing, uh, as well as some other major corporates. And so, and I'm also a Swarm Vision partner, as you all know, and uh, that's a wonderful innovation profiling tool that we use. Thank you so much, Curtis. Christina, would you please introduce yourself and tell our audience a bit about your role? Absolutely. So I am actually a veteran educator by trade. I am a former New York City high school principal turned education and equity entrepreneur. Um, I shifted out of principal leadership back in 2017, actually made my pivot um, more so due to circumstance. My mom had been diagnosed at the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. My son was almost two at the time. And so I just wanted to um, still be able to have an impact in education, um, but also have more time and uh, uh, flexibility and freedom. And so I started my consulting gig uh, back, like I said, back in 2017. And then more recently, due to the pandemic, I made another pivot into um, 
the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And so uh, it's been about six months now or so um, that my best friend and I started what's called Wide Dynamic Dialogues. She's a former uh, corporate health and wellness executive. So we do wellness, inclusion, diversity, and equity work. And we help to promote individual and organizational flourishing for um, now corporations, nonprofits, and also schools. Thank you so much, Christina. And Steve, uh, we'd love for you to give us a quick introduction to yourself and tell us a bit about the work that you do. So good afternoon, everyone, and I'm uh, thrilled to be with you all this afternoon. So I'm Steve Farchstein, and I'm in Richmond, Virginia. And my background is such where on the business side, I have spent uh, my, most of my role in financial services, uh, taking executive positions uh, within the banking world and mortgage banking specifically. Uh, I'm about to start a new role as a C-suite uh, role on Monday with a new financial institution, which I'm very excited about. Along with the corporate side of me has been my work in the nonprofit space, uh, where I have been uh, with the March of Dimes as a volunteer leader for now going on my 31st year. And I recently finished my role as the National Volunteer Leadership Council Chairperson for the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, enabling me to work with boards of directors around the country uh, in our quest uh, to work on our mission with the health of all moms and babies. I've absolutely loved that. As you can imagine, I got to meet and spend time with uh, incredible people from around, not only learned from them, but tried to be part of their help in moving our mission forward. Uh, the other uh, hat that I wear is I am the father to Brandon, uh, Brandon was born with a very rare form of dwarfism, and so while that might seem a challenge, and it has been, uh, Brandon is now a motivational speaker, so depending on who you are in this country, you might know me as Brandon's dad. Uh, Kelly, thank you for having me today, and um, again, great to be with you. Well, thank you all for being here. For those of you who are in the audience, we'd love to hear in the chat uh, where you're working and what your day-to-day -day work is like and what drove you to today's Business Bite session. Looking forward to hearing your perspectives as well. As you can probably guess from the diversity of experience that our panelists bring, we are thrilled to be able to explore the conversation about pivot and profit with this group. Um, starting off with you, Christina, I'd love your perspective on what role innovation plays in business strategy? Sure, so um, to me, innovation is essentially a business's, um, it's their competitive advantage, right? It's however they are playing in the space that they're in, whether it's schools, whether it's law, um, medical, your innovation is what's gonna separate you and distinguish you from the competition. And um, you know the way that I see it, um, the best way to have innovation is through diversity, equity, and inclusion, and bringing in that wellness piece and really recognizing the whole person, right? And so we already know, I kind of like to talk about the evolution, right? So it kind of started just with diversity. People were like, okay, we need to have spaces that have diversity, and that can be through race, religion, um, gender, you know, those kind of census types of diversity that we talk about, but there's also the diversity just of thought, of culture, um, and of experience, right? That's how you're able to get those innovative ideas. And then we, then people said, okay, it's not just D because we can invite people to be a part of an organization, but unless we include them, right, in real ways, unless we are making sure that they're seen, they're heard, they're valued, they're supported, um, we're not gonna optimize as much. And then we we drew in the E, right? We drew in the equity because then we realized, okay, we can have diversity, we can include them, but are they having access to equal access to opportunities, to resources? This is where you can start to think of more of like the structures of like, you know, do you have a, a means of mentorships, sponsor, sponsorships, um, advancement tracks, right? And it's putting all those things together. Um, and then when you integrate the wellness piece of, you know, is this person being seen as their whole self, feeling ready to belong and be able to contribute. And when you have teams that are diverse, inclusive and equitable, right? And we're, in, we're integrating the wellness piece, um, 
then we we actually will see that innovation happen. We can you know go through so much research that shows the more you have those, the more companies do. They're more innovative. They're more profitable. You're able to hire and retain, recruit and retain people better, and you're also able to um, to get people excited to be there, right? The actual engagement level. So it's not just that they show up and stay longer, um, kind of just rolling through the motions. People who show up to organizations that have that culture that really um, builds builds that community is going to have that higher level of innovation. So to me, innovation is critical and you can't have innovation without the, the wide framework. Thank you so much, Christina. I think that brings uh, such an interesting frame for the conversation. As I move to Steve, I saw you nodding along. I, I know as you shared your background and your experience, you provided um, sort of a whole self uh, perspective, Steve. I'd love to hear your thoughts on innovation and the role it plays in business strategy, as well as your thoughts on Christina's frame for innovation. Couldn't agree more with what Christina said. I'm so I'm, I'm spot on with her and totally aligned. So I'm going to put on my nonprofit hat when we talk about business strategy. Just talk about these last you know 11, 12 months that we've been through. Uh, we've had to change everything that we've done. Now the great news for the organization that I'm mainly aligned with is that we had staff working from home already as part of some realignment, re recognizing again from a business strategy standpoint, do I need bricks and mortar? Or can I create cost saves and efficiencies by having people home-based and have them go out to others' offices when in fact face-to-face -face was, was needed? Uh, in terms of fundraising, uh, those that were event-driven, well, what do you do when you can't have an event in person? When you can't have a gala, a march, uh, a walk, a ride, et cetera? Um, and the bottom line is, but it has to be done because you have to raise both your brand awareness and funds for that mission to move forward. So what do you do? Well, you make innovation the driver of what you do. Uh, you make sure your people are bought into, I have to stay mission focused in order to you know, come up and meet our uh, success objectives. Uh, I have to make sure that Zoom calls are uh, comfortable with people. Uh, I have to make sure that our folks that have been supportive still feel like they're a part of our organization. I have to make sure that donors are not overwhelmed if they are with their personal challenges. I need to be sensitive to that, but be it they corporate donors or individual donors. Uh, and quite frankly, and most importantly, with innovation, you know, during you know this whole COVID scenario, which I've been so focused on, it's making sure I stay focused on the people. When you boil it all down, I don't really care as much about the technology, which of course has played a major role in business strategy. I care about the people because if you have staff, be they in the for-profit or nonprofit, and they're hurting or they need to make sure that you see the challenges that they're having, um, nothing happens. And so I've made it a point, although that doesn't sound strategic, I think when you focus on the people and show empathy towards them, uh, that will help you with your overall business strategy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. I see Christina nodding along and Curtis, I see you smiling. Would love your opinion and for you to, to weigh in uh, with your perspective on this frame. Well, I disagree with Steve and Christina completely. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to keep it interesting here, right? No, <laughs> I'm completely aligned with them. So um, I, I want to dig in and, and I'll pick up on what Steve said about the people side. I think that's key. And it, and it goes to what my definition of strategy is, because um, I think th these both these terms, innovation and strategy, you know, we throw them around a lot, but what do they really mean? So for me, what do I mean by strategy? I, I, it's not a plan. I don't matter, doesn't matter how strategic or long range your plan is, it's not strategy. Strategy is kind of, for me, what comes before, during and after plans. It's To me, it's like a set of living mental models. It's a way of seeing a market or a space. And it's, it's how we ask really, really good questions about these spaces. You know, we say, where is the opportunity here? Where do we play? And it's always that where question. And it's a conversation that people are having to Steve and Christina's point. Um, and that's followed usually by how do we play? You know, what are the options here? And that you consider and you debate different things. 
Well, debate is benefited by diversity of opinion, as Christina hit. And then, you know, we might hit on more of a battle plan. How do we win once we know the space and how we want to play? I like um, something Amazon has done. Uh, Jeff Bezos wrote about it in his um, uh, one of his shareholder letters. He does that each year. And he talked about the six page summary, if you've ever heard of that. And it's like, if you can condense a strategy, an idea, a, a, a vision into a six page memo and make it really compelling and clear, you're on the verge of a strategy and something that you can debate and talk about and have a conversation, a live conversation around. So if you don't have that live conversation, if your halls are not abuzz with that kind of conversation, then I think your strategy just falls back on best practices or some kind of like fast follow copycat strategy. Um, so I think for strategy to be good in my book, it's just got to be organic, homegrown, a living conversation and inclusive, you know, as, as Christina said. So I, that kind of living strategy, that great conversation requires innovation. So innovation is everything to business strategy. Absolutely. And to use a phrase, invincible companies, which is kind of in common currency right now. Um, I, I think that you really need to have an adaptive strategy. So if you're continuing to adapt and evolve your strategy through that conversation, that's A plus. You know, to some of yours, that's madness. To some people, they think, you know, it's got to have a plan and it's got to be five years long. We have to try it out. But I think if you've been working the wrong plan for five years, you're five years behind. So the only thing that shouldn't change is your company's North Star, your long purpose. And I think you know, if, if that's changing, then that's kind of madness. But I think if you're anchored around a purpose, you evolve your strategy often. So that's, that's where I, I'm coming down on innovation and strategy. Well, I love this foundation for our conversation today, uh, starting with people, uh, the diversity of people, the adaptability of people, um, the idea that uh, strategy and innovation aren't fixed and that change agility is a key aspect of this, uh, I think is, is a great place for us to begin the conversation. Steve, I'll move the conversation to you next, um, asking you if there's an organization you believe provides a great example of this, somebody that does this exceptionally well. Sure. So, uh, again, I don't mean to make all of my comments regarding this whole concept of the last 12 months with, with COVID, but I think it's a perfect example when you're talking about innovation of the changes that have had to happen. And uh, my target, quite frankly, has been uh, our, and I'm not even going to name one, it's a couple of the local community banks that I've seen here in my area, because with the uh, Paycheck Protection Plan that came out, so think about this, that was helping to support their uh, patrons, if you will, with monies needed for survival. So they had to work on systems, right? They had to work on making sure they had the capabilities from home because they didn't want any of their people in an office from a, a, a safety standpoint. Uh, and quite frankly, people were needing the money to survive. If that's not pressure, what is? So talk about you know these banks that all came together, uh, they shared information, the association that handles them was amazing in terms of resourcefulness. So we talk about you know uh, using your resources to drive your innovation. And by the way, having no prep time, that to me was the most impressive. When you take an organization and have to say, you don't have a choice. I, it reminds me of Apollo 13, the movie, right? They didn't have a choice except to figure out what was that solution going to look like to get these astronauts home safely? Well, we're going to find a way. Fail, what was that phrase? Failure is not an option. And so I take in, in admiration what so many of these financial institutions you know, were able to do uh, in order, again, to fund those people. And the good news there is you saw the outcomes. You were able to keep businesses open and you're able to keep people employed, which then enables them to spend their money back in the communities for food and other resources that are needed. So I took that again, and of course, innovation is constant in that arena, but over the last 12 months, you know, when I saw that question, I got, that's what first came to mind, Kelly. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Curtis, I'll toss this one over to you next. Would love your perspective on an organization you think does this exceptionally well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'm going to um, call out a music label that I like a lot. Anyone know Ground Up Music? Anyone heard of Snarky Puppy, the band? Oh, okay. You should listen. They're, they're amazing. So um, the founder of Snarky Puppy. Curtis, they... we're not as hip as you. Oh, come on. 
<laughs> They're a very diverse label, I want you to know too, and they value diversity a lot. Um, and the reason I want to bring out um, this, this, um, this particular example, besides they're, they're just really cool and hip, is that they also, um, they're, they already have creativity in their DNA. You know, I mean, this is a creative music label and they're an indie music label. Uh, about 20 to 25 artists in their fold and just all high quality different genres and stuff like that. So they're already a very interesting, innovative um, label pushing the edge of what we think of as a music label. So, but then the pandemic hits and what they were able to do at the speed of COVID um, and just immediately taking advantage of the fact they had fans and people like me right around the world who love what they do they said, hey, let's just pivot and create new experiences. And, and as a point of contrast here, think about the fact that Broadway in New York City is still dead, okay? Those poor art actors, uh, they may have put up some kind of interesting, you know, Patreon page or something for themselves, but as a whole, um, New York theater scene isn't weathering the, this experience very well. But what Ground Up did was they said, look, let's take care of our artists, let's do some stuff. So they began to, um, uh, again, tap into this fan base and re-catered to them during this pandemic with innovative offerings. You know, there was at-home concerts, there was special meet the band sessions where you get to know, you know, your favorite musicians, um, which was just really lovely because I've seen them in concert a few times or met, but never really met the artists, right? So getting to interact, ask them nerdy music questions. Um, when George Floyd was killed, um, you know, and the Black Lives Matter movement really kicked into high gear, thinking back, and that's about the time the pandemic was kicking in, they held a very powerful conversation and invited their artists and their fans into that conversation. And they leaned into the discomfort. I mean, there were tears on that call. Um, and, and they did all this just with the quality they bring to the music. They supported their label musicians. They allowed them to create master classes. You know, if you're a drummer like me, you see my drum set back there, um, you know, and you want to play like Larnell Lewis or Jameson Ross, these badass drummers they have, you can book private lessons. Uh, so Ground Up tied that all together. They provided the digital infrastructure, the e-commerce mechanisms. They did it within weeks and they didn't just throw up a Zoom space. I mean, no offense to Zoom and I know we're in Zoom here, but they were more creative. They used Crowdcast. And when they asked their fans to pay for the sessions, they provided a sliding scale from $0 to $100. And the very first online gathering, I think I, it clocked in over a thousand attendees. Average ticket price was $25. So, you know, give fans the option of free and they still will pay you money because they love you. And I think many businesses can learn from what companies like Ground Up are doing, the kind of trust they put in, in their fans and their artists. So I love that story with Ground Up. Thank you so much, Curtis. And I love this business bites session because I learned so much, whether it's about new music that I should be paying attention to or nonprofit organization strategy. Uh, I always learn something as a takeaway and I'm certain I'm going to learn from you and your example, Christina. So I'll turn it over to you to share any org you think is doing this well. Sure. So first of all, yeah, I want to reaffirm Curtis that organization is is such a shining example of wide work done well. Um, and again, proving the point that when you um, approach things from a holistic sense, you, you will be more successful. That innovation creates the success um, that creates that profitability and sustainability. So I think that's a great example. Um, um, and I have an example from what I thought I was going to talk about. Um, actually, Steve, you sort of um, triggered this for me, and it should have been an obvious one to me because I'm an educator, but the pandemic literally shut schools down, right? No advanced warning. Um, um, people, you know, for the most part probably thought, okay, we're going to have to finish this out from the spring into the end of the June. Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to go back to normal in September and it became increasingly clear that um, we have a new normal. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, I I can't say that every school in every district everywhere is, is, is doing well, but I've been really heartened by some of these more progressive pockets who've said, we're actually gonna use this as an opportunity to reimagine what schools can be and can do. And I think that really to, um, more corporate settings is let's reimagine what work is and can be and can do. Because I think, you know, as a lot of people were putting 
to get back to normal, it begged the question, was normal really working before? Is this, uh, is this something that you feel you want to return to? Because we have this opportunity now to, again, like reimagine, because I think, you know, one of the things that we've touched upon in a, a program that I've done called the 21 Day Harmony Journey, which is all about um, helping organizations to support their employees to know the signs and symptoms of burnout, to recognize the nine essentials of total health, um, which cover mental health, physical health, spiritual health, career satisfaction, financial stability, um, close relationships, social connections, meaningful purpose and playful living, right? So having that understanding of what health it is to be healthy, it's more than just eating less and moving more, right? Um, and, and understanding how leadership ties into that, right? Like how are you modeling and promoting self-care, well-being, all of those things? Um, and thinking about the pot of uh, the practical policies and practices that you you integrate into your organization. And what we learned in in our pilot program, which just confirms the research that's out there, is that you know women and people of color are more at risk of uh, experiencing burnout, they are disproportionately actually experiencing the burnout and they're disproportionately having to leave the workforce. So back in the day, having a flexible work schedule or remote working, which could have kept a woman or a person of color in the workforce would have been shunned, would have been totally like, no, we can't do that. But all of a sudden this pandemic has created a reality where everybody actually had to do that. And now we're not gonna be able to go back in the future and say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. You have to be in the office because we've learned that you can have a hybrid model or you can have a remote model. And so I think um, what's really important for us to, to think about as organizations is what is the vision for what we want our organization to be and to do and how we want to operate because we, we actually get to create that a lot more than we realize because so much of the time we're just, we're doing what was our, what was always done, and this whole workshop today is right is talking about innovation, and innovation is about doing things that have never been done, right, or doing them differently. So, thank you so much for that perspective, and uh, all all three of you offered such an interesting um, lens at which to explore how a company responds to this, sort of in a broad way. And I love, Christina, that you introduced the idea of, of not just a company that's doing this exceptionally well or an industry that's doing this well or responding to it, but, but what lessons can we learn from that and, um, and, and how can we apply that to be better, do better, and create healthier um, more supportive environment as we move forward. And so I think that's a lovely transition uh, to the next frame conversation, uh, which is really about uh, a company that shifted their business strategy or product uh, or market focus and amplified profit. Because I think what you're speaking to there, Christina, is that when companies are creating equity, when they have a, as Curtis mentioned, North Star, that's a solid foundation to build from, and they embrace the diversity of experience across all of the aspects of the human experience. And I love that you shared these sort of nine variations of, of what really composes health or wellness. Um, in an environment, but when a company really does that, not only is it better for their employees, but it, it also has this added benefit of being good for their bottom line. And so Curtis, I'm gonna to toss it over to you and I'm gonna ask you to share an example about a company that has made a pivot that also benefited their bottom line. Absolutely, sure. Um, so I like that you, you specifically say amplified profit, but I think this can also be amplified impact if you're a nonprofit, right? So um, I think either works, but I'm, I'm gonna go into a for-profit case that I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, and it's the company called Pro Sabin, um, and they're based in Europe and Germany. Uh, not one of my clients, but my, my buddy, Dr. Mark Snukas worked with them on this, uh, this transformation of their business model or evolution, the kind of evolution of their business model that uh, I was referring to before. 
this happened a little pre-COVID, so I, I, this is not a pandemic innovation story per se. They, they made this move maybe you know, five to 10 years ago. I've been on that journey for a while. Um, but uh, what I really liked about this story is that it's, it's a traditional sort of TV network. Think of like CNN, but just sort of plant them in Germany kind of thing. You know, big television network, media conglomerate. And um, they uh, had kind of grown to a point, a fairly mature point, and, and sales had fairly leveled, leveled off. But the leadership, as leadership is prone to do from time to time, set a very ambitious target. You will grow, thou shalt grow revenue by 1 billion over the next five years. Right, which represented a 42% increase from their existing whatever, two and a half billion in revenues a year. So how are they gonna do that? Um, and especially when they had some constraints, European and German law limits the number of advertising minutes per day. You can you know, put ads in people's eyeballs, right? So they, they, and they couldn't just raise their ad rates. You know, that wasn't really an option. They, they could, but it wasn't gonna work. So what do you think? Um, what, what would they do? They did design thinking for one thing, they began to empathize with their customers and that's the first step in a design thinking process. Um, who, are their, who are our customers and who are, this is the critical question, who are our non-customers, right? Who are some, uh, they asked who would, be, who would be folks that would like to advertise on TV, but they've been locked out, perhaps due to price. And could we develop a free offering for them, right? That could work. And that led to a series of innovation sprints and workshops. And, and they ended up focusing on startups and small and medium enterprises who had been their non-customers. Uh, you know, those who couldn't afford ads or didn't have the, or they didn't have experience, right? Planning and doing a fancy television campaign just wasn't what, something they'd done. So they began prototyping this idea out. And what do you think they came up with? Kelly, you have any hunch what ProSaban landed on as a new model? I don't know, group, <laughs> group <laughs> advertising. <laughs> That's not a bad guess. Yeah, they actually came up with um, a, an approach which they called um, media for revenue share. So in other words, they could give away, they would basically give advertising for free on the TV network, help them build up the ads, make the, make the ads lovely and you know really high production value, that kind of thing. Um, and, and they were able to then take a, share of the revenues that were generated by the after the ad because the advertising worked and it led to more sales. Um, and now what was interesting, they had the cash in hand to prove that TV advertising really worked, you know, becoming a rev share partner. They also learned which were like the ideal companies to work with. And this was over a couple of years, a lot of just simple prototyping and trying different things. They started with five companies and began to realize that startups were kind of challenging. Uh, so they made the startups pay a fixed fee to kind of give them some skin in the game. That was one of the things they learned. And they, they learned that online companies were best to work with. There was a company called Sundalos, which is like Zappos for us, um, that was perfect. And so the ads would run and, and then Sandalos revenue would shoot up and they got a piece of that. And then they moved uh, finally into media for equity share. So they got a piece of the company, a piece of the advertiser. So now they're a true partner in their advertiser success. So after two years of this testing, learning, pivoting, trying different things, they were, they were starting to scale. And the result is they hit the $1 billion goal within three years. They went to a 2 billion goal above that a couple of years later. And now, you know, the portfolio of advertising is more than 50% are non-traditional TV advertisers. And um, it's, it's just what you do when you run these experiments, try simple tests. I mean, the very first MVP was literally, you know, you know, this technique, you write like a fake press release, you know, you just put it out there. They hadn't done anything other than that, but it's that smart, simple, step-by-step -step business testing and they led themselves to this whole new model and just did it very, very smartly. So that's, that's my example. I love this example because it introduces the concept of adjacent innovation as well and, mm -hmm. and, and really exploring what market aren't we serving uh, and thinking about the customer engagement side of it and, and how you can, using an existing model, serve something new. It also diversified a media company, which is a really important exactly. thing to do in today's marketplace. This is really an incredible strategy. So great example. Uh, Christina, I'm looking forward to hearing your example. So I'm going to cheat a little bit because unlike Curtis and Steve, I, I'm not 
a corporate um, guru of, of any kind. So I'm actually going to use myself. <laughs> so as I explained before, I'm a veteran educator. I started an education and equity consulting company, but it was all based on schools, right? I was working with principals, superintendents, um, helping them with, you know, strategic planning, data analysis, professional development, executive coaching, that type of type of thing. And so as I explained during the pandemic, my business was literally like eviscerated because all the schools shut down, um, you know, budgets were slashed, actual teachers were being laid off. So, you know, consultants were rightfully so the last thing anybody was worried about. Um, and so I, as an individual, but also as an organization had to think about what are the skills that I have and the expertise that I have that could serve a broader community outside of schools. And so for me, it was really, it was a, it was quick because schools has always been what my driving passion is. And so I said, well, a lot, a lot of these, of these organizational change skills, a lot of the actual diversity, equity, inclusion skills that I have, these are transferable. Uh, but then when that happened, it, it, it expedited I did the urgent for And so I think it was thinking about what are the exact pain points that I could solve with that, that skill set to this new broadened. And I don't like to say it wasn't a shift. It was an expansion, right? So it's thinking about how you can expand what you do to um, other, other um, clientele, right? And so specifically, um, it also though required, because in the beginning, I think uh, my partner and I, we just kind of were like, we can do all of the things, which perhaps we could have, but over a very small window of time, we realized let's, let's sort of narrow it down to three major um, offerings. So we, we got really, it, it, it's, it's boiling down to the unconscious racial bias training. We do talk about other types of biases, but obviously racial bias is, is the one that is causing the, the most challenge issues. We also um, have focused on anti-burnout, right? This is very particular to the pandemic range. Right? Institutions have employees that um, were probably suffering from burnout before, but this just really exacerbated it. And so that was sort of our second and our third piece was women's leadership development. So I think, you know, the other, um, the other, other advice you say, don't try to be all the things to all of the people, right? Figure out what you can sort of niche down on um, and double down on and be really great at it. And I think that's what we've been able to do is show our special sauce, show why, you know, we're not the only people, we're not the only players in the game of women's leadership development or, you know, wellness in the workplace or, you know, um, anti-bias trainings, but we have a particular lens, particular lens that we use that I think differentiates us from that the competition. And again, it's, it's the innovation. I think being an educator, I am a learning architect. Not every HR person brings that to the table. Not every DEI person brings that to the table. So I think that's been our special sauce, that combination of my um, partner's um, wellness, corporate health and wellness understanding. Because a lot of, again, HR people don't necessarily know the wellness component from a medical perspective or from that business perspective. And then me as the educator with the pedagogy around how to create and construct those things. That's that's what I'm coming from. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. I think, you know, it, it's it's always a shock to me how we jump on these calls and it feels like we've had a prep session because people build on uh, the person before. And so continuing this idea of sort of adjacent innovation and then adding into it, what's your differentiator um, and, and thinking about not only the customer experience, but what your USP is uh, as you're going through and you're thinking about that. Um, really looking forward to Steve sharing and, and adding to the conversation. So Steve, handing it over to you to talk to us about a company that shifted their business strategy uh, and amplified profit or, to Curtis's point, increased their impact in the nonprofit sector. Well, first, I think we should acknowledge the thousands of businesses we can talk about that are still here. 
And if you're still here mm -hmm. after the hurdles that have been going on, uh, uh, the good news is there hopefully are lots of examples, right, that we should be talking about. Uh, but a company in particular that I know fairly well, uh, my daughter works there, is the Education Advisory Board, EAB. And a little bit touching on what Christina was talking to, the first thing they did, which I loved, they focused internally on our employees. Are my employees okay? Are they safe? Are they healthy? How do I protect them? They did a brilliant job of communicating. Everyone knew from the get-go uh, when the office was going to be open. And in other words, and it wasn't. And they did it so far in advance that if there was childcare needs or family issues or elder care or pets or whatever, you knew from day one when we're going to be shut down. And they've had, of course, adjustments as the pandemic went on, knowing that we're all you know, navigating these uncharted waters. So that's what they did. The second thing they did is tools. What tools do my employees need from working from home uh, so that they can be as effective where they're located? They sent everyone a check right off the bat for $500 to say, Curtis, I want to make sure you have any type of equipment you need. If that's a desk, a chair, an extra monitor, a docking station, uh, anything you need, better access to your internet, if you will, here's a check. And they said, even if you don't spend it on equipment, keep the money. They didn't need to see receipts, that trust element that was there. So they put people first. And when you put people first, they'll pass that on to their clients, if you will, right, as to how they treat them. Uh, and then they, of course, focus then on our clients. What can we do to support their needs? Not our needs, but their needs, because if we support their needs, our profits and income and revenues should show. And that's what they did. They do events. They had a pivot. Events now became virtual. That's okay. We're still going to provide great content, right? They're going to be organized. They're going to be facilitated, and we'll still be able to provide that. And then the second thing they did was what other topics than other than we normally talk about? Matriculation might not have been as key as uh, crisis management. And so they know, okay, let's help everybody uh, to, to help them with crisis management so that that's how they can sustain themselves. Athletics. I, did anyone here realize the millions and millions of dollars colleges and universities make through their athletic programs? Well, what do you do? I mean, that's revenue that helps them with, you know, so much of, the, of their facilities, et cetera. So what do you do when that revenue is down? They came up with advisory services to make sure that, hey guys, I know it's down. Here's how to prep for the future. What other revenue streams could there be? Uh, and of course, all the time realizing safety and health first and showing compassion and empathy, both internal and external. And quite frankly, I think they're doing well. And you know, to Christina's point, sometimes right place at the right time, but that doesn't mean you're gonna win. It means you have something. Mm -hmm. It's how you handle it and what you can show for success. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. And uh, as usual, I, I think that there are so many talking points that we could start an entirely new Business Bites conversation just about uh, this concept, right, of looking uh, within uh, at your organization and making sure that you understand what the organizational product or service that you're delivering USP points are, looking at the audience you serve and the audience you're not serving and thinking about them, and looking at your team culture and, and taking this 360-degree view, as we say it on its axis, and looking at the products, the people um, from all of these different angles, and then deciding the go forward strategy, um, going back to that very first question, thinking about the agility of, of that pivot um, from a place of um, a logical leap of faith, right? So you're not making change for the sake of change or change just for profit, but you're making a strategic change that you can test based on an educated assessment of your customers, your non-customers, um, in this very empathetic way. And so I, I love that the topic was innovation, but we keep coming back to this concept of, of humanity and empathy. And, and so thank you uh, to all of you for, for bringing in that lens. I think it's a really nice transition uh, to this next piece, which is about leadership, because um, there is no doubt that 
the change process is one that impacts the humanity of the workforce. It impacts the customer experience. It impacts the team members delivering on behalf of the organization. And it impacts the leaders who are, who are driving from the front. Uh, I wear a HR hat a lot of the time in human resources. And uh, human resources professionals have certainly uh, been at a pillar stake uh, going through the last 12 months. Um, where they've had to step up and uh, act as if they have certainty about what's to come, um, and and there's an impact there. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Christina, and I'm going to ask if you were coaching a leader about innovation and the role it plays in organi- organizational success, what advice would you offer to that leader? This time I don't have to be as imaginary because this is actually what I do when I um, when I work with my coaching clients, right? So um, I'm going to come back to a term that I like to call holistic leadership, right? I think, you know, much of, um, you know, when we look at leadership developments, it's usually like performance, productivity, and I think those are all really important aspects of leadership. Um, but to me, um, in order to get there, you have to really start with the whole person. And so I think um, I have a sort of an approach of like, what are you doing to activate, cultivate, and align a sound mind, a strong body, and a sage spirit? So it's first just acknowledging that we are multifaceted human beings that have different, you know, facets to us that need to be nurtured and nourished. And um, oftentimes, I, I also like to talk about rest. And that's, I am preaching to myself when I say this, but we live in a society that really pushes people to go, go and go. And we wear, you know, I can remember, um, especially in my earlier principal days, um, you know, coming in, being the first person to get into the building, being the very last person to leave, like including the custodial staff um, and kind of feeling really great about that. And in hindsight and retrospect, I'm like, that was not only so unhealthy, it was also putting a pressure on my employees to think that they had to work like that in order to look like they were being productive or in order to look like you know they cared. And so I think um, we as leaders have to really model what good um, boundaries and I don't want to call it work-life balance. We refer to it as work-life harmony, right? Because there are ebbs and flows and there are things that need to get done. So it's not to say like we put these imaginary um, boundaries in place and then we just, oh, I'm just going to stop because that's when I said I was supposed to. There are days that you do have to push yourself, but it has to be, um, there has to be an ebb and flow that allows you, again, when you have that mind, body, spirit, those that rhythm, those routines, those rituals, then you can handle when something is maybe off for a moment because you're in general, it's like the plate spinning, right? Like if you have enough momentum, you can move for a second to come over here, but that plate is still spinning and you'll come back to it in time. Um, And then I think once you've done that as the individual, what are you doing? What are the systems and structures you have in place to ensure that all of your people are getting that? Because I think there's sort of two two paths that need to be happening concurrently. So it's like, as an individual, we have to have that self-inquiry, that self-reflection and that self-actualization. But as a group, like we have to figure out how can I communicate better with those around me? How can I connect with those around me better and how can I collaborate? Um, so my, you know, my company is called Head, Heart, Hands Consulting and it's really, um, was was rooted in this belief that at an organizational level, different people are sort of driven in different ways. So your head people, they need to know all the facts and figures. They need to know the stats, the, the, all the evidence base before they're like really motivated to move forward. And other people are much more heart-centered, right? They want to know um, how does this impact people? What's the relationships that are going to be driven from this? Um, and then you have your hands people that are like, I mean, in, the, in when I was in, you know, schools, it was like, First period, 8 a.m., what do I do? They need those sort of tactical strategies. And so as leaders, we need to make sure that we are speaking to all of those people in all of our in all of um, all of the systems and structures that we have, that it's hitting all three of those, those places. And so I think if you can um, think of think of those two sets of ideas, you're going to drive innovation because people are in the right space. And um, lastly, I'll just say this, particularly right now, because of the pandemic, because of the economic downturn, because of the civil unrest and, and sort of social tensions that are there, 
a lot of us are very stressed. And when we are stressed, our brains default to a more narrow thinking. We, we fall back on the way we usually think about something. That is uh, going to create a huge obstacle for innovation. So for some people who think I'm a little more woo, it's not woo. I'm, I'm, I'm saying these are real practical things that you need to think about in order to drive that innovation that's going to drive the profit and the impact that we're all seeking. So sorry, that was a little long, but. <laughs> it's very valuable. And I, I love I love the setup uh, for for this um, in thinking about your example of your early leadership and your learning as a leader. So uh, your self-evolution for me was a key takeaway in that leadership coaching, right? Thinking about going from setting up this grind mentality to more of an observational work-life harmony. Uh, we talk about it as work-life alignment. And, and I think that... Um, just that example from your personal evolution and your example of the advice you'd give is, is incredibly powerful and an acknowledgement of that human experience. When I was talking about the HR professional, it's a stressful time to be in work and stress, uh, fear of change. There's a grief process associated with change and it does impact leadership. Um, sorry, I see I you nodding, that. Steve. I, I'm sorry, I just wanna say, I love that you, you made the uh, point about the HR professional. We often ask for, for those in HR, it's like, who's caring for the caregiver? Because right now, HR mm -hmm. has a lot of pressure on them to be caring for the, the individuals in their organization. That's, I get it, that's part of their job. But it's also like, how are they being cared for? And how are they being poured into and nurtured? It's really important. And I think that's where senior executive leadership has to step up and be caring for them, knowing that they're caring for, for everybody else. And um, also the mantra, I would say, less hustle, more flow. That's been my mantra for 2021. <laughs> I love it. That's a great takeaway. And Steve, I saw you nodding along. I'm going to toss the mic over to you. So my big thing is context. What is the context of the situation, you know, that that leader is? Is it for profit? Is it nonprofit? And it's all about what hat they should be wearing in the context of the situation. And a very quick example, I did a session the other day and someone on the panel said, well, as a leader, sometimes I like, I like to let my people fail. And I understand that. And that might be one way of handling, you know, teaching and coaching. But the flip side is not if it's at a bank where a failure could result in zillions of dollars worth of challenges and systems issues and credit issues, et cetera. So yes and no, but it's about context. Uh, the other thing too is I also like to make sure everyone involved has a mutually agreed upon definition of success. Not the word success, is it mutually agreed upon? Because I've been in so many situations where it's not, and what I thought was what I needed to do and I should be doing, it wasn't, not because I was wrong, it's because the other party or parties, company or not, were not under the same umbrella as to what we should be doing. So again, it's making sure everybody understands that. And then again, is it, I, I call it the says who and so what. You know, who am I trying to please? Uh, if I'm in a, a C-suite role, don't forget, I've got a board of directors, if you will, above me, even if I'm the C-suite. But then I've got employees below me and customers. Are my behaviors the same? And am I innovated enough to be able to pivot to make sure I'm doing the right things about communicating, educating, collaborating, navigating, demonstrating, all of those factors of what I need to do to be successful. And that's what I'd share with the people that I'd be coaching. Thanks so much, Steve. Curtis, I'd love your thoughts on this. Sure, sure, glad to round it out. So when I'm working with leaders, um, I would say the first thing is I counsel them to be bold. Boldness, uh, what was the quote? Boldness has power, genius, and greatness in it, right? I, it's often attributed to Goethe, but it's, it's actually someone else. But anyway, uh, boldness is important, not foolish, but bold. And I think the nub of that is to um, inculcate a culture of um, 
the safe failures to go to Steve's point. Yeah, you don't wanna have a zillion um, dollar failure, um, but we want to be able to explore strategic horizons. So it's minding the famous explore versus exploit continuum. You know, so little bets on the explore and on the exploit, working them both. So give yourself and your teams the chance to explore new territory, to boldly go, right? Star Trek, boldly go where no team has gone before. Um, I love open innovation programs and I encourage uh, my clients to look at them, things like Adobe Kickbox that kind of democratize innovation. If you don't know Kickbox, uh, Steve, it's a little like giving $500, but comes wrapped in a red box and has some beautiful instructions on how to do design thinking and you get chocolate and coffee inside. It's just this a program to encourage people to explore. And I like leaders who distribute that and push it out throughout the organization. But for the leader I'm coaching, the leader sets the tone and they need to articulate a massive purpose. I like to say a massive transformative purpose, a direction, kind of like Pro Sabin did in my story with the revenue goal. It was a massive revenue goal, but this can be anything, you know, it can, but it could, it should be bold. It really should be bold. You know, Sir Richard Branson, if your dreams don't scare you, they're too small. If you want to really spark innovation, you've got to make a bold um, initiative, uh, set a bold Kind of horizon. So that's that's job one. I would say the other thing I like to, to uh, help the organization do uh, to not be foolish yet bold at the same time is just balance the portfolio in a smart way. So I love the way exponential organizations or the XO community, as we call it, does this when we take companies on the transformation innovation journey. We have two parallel streams of activity and we have teams working along both streams. One stream we call core and the core um, teams are working on um, the core business model. And rather than a, a radical change to it, you're actually preparing the business model to be disrupted. So you're anticipating market changes and you're helping the core business sort of pre-inoculate itself, right? Like give yourself an early injection against whatever uh, disruptive virus is coming your way to use sort of COVID language. So that's the core move. And then you have these edge teams working parallel and they're looking at these edgier, uh, Kelly to your word, adjacent opportunities or even radical um, new startups that could be created outside the core. That's really smart. And I've taken clients along that journey and it works. The last thing I would say uh, that I like to co counsel around um, when I'm doing innovation coaching is just remember that, you know, the, the, the success of the future, I think the, um, the moat, you know, we often, you know, Michael Porter talked about moats back in the day. The moat of the future is not economic. It's not size. It's not price. It's network. You know, the network based moats will secure your brand presence. Everyone will be talking about you. They will secure your innovation capabilities because you've used Kickbox and you've engaged your suppliers, your customers, your employees, and all of them are in that hot dialogue about what comes next. You know, they're abuzz with it. And I, I guess maybe one more thing. Why not? One more. Do I have one more minute? <laughs> <laughs> Last thing I'll say is metrics of success. I give them concrete handles. Diversity is one of those handles. Are you really measuring the diverse voices in the room? Uh, are you buying political air cover and, and things like that? There are very, very um, important innovation metrics that I just try to make them aware of. And it's got to be like visible and everybody's tracking to those. Uh, that's enough for me. <laughs> well, I think this conversation could go on and on. I've certainly enjoyed it. I did see a question come through in the chat, and normally we open it up to questions at the end, but I do want to be aware of time and respect everybody's time. Uh, so I'll just share uh, that the chat question that came through uh, was asking if we used Cotter's eight-step change model for leading change. Uh, I personally subscribe to a, a methodology that we use on Honest Access. Uh, it's grounded um, with principles from a variety of interdisciplinary backgrounds, um, but I'll open it up to the group and see if anybody else is familiar with or uses Cotter's eight-step model. I haven't, but I'd love to hear from whoever has. No, I do not. Um... Yeah, I, it's, I am familiar with it and I have, I've used it before. Um, it's, if I'm not mistaken, again, it's funny because like I said, I'm not um, a, a corporate guru, but the, the principal program that I went through was the New York City Leadership Academy. And so I always joke that a lot of what we got was almost like a mini MBA plus the, like an EDD, that's kind of the integration. So we learned different um, 
models that were outside of traditional education models. Um, and so, and I believe they've, they've updated it. I think it was developed in the nineties and then they, they did like a reset. Um, and they've made one that's a little bit more responsive to the way things change now, the way change happens now that you have to be a little bit more responsive, not to say the last, the, the original model was a little bit more prescriptive, but I think, um, the way that they've um, modified it since has made it um, be more with the times, if that makes sense. Mm. It's a great perspective. And I, I, I think that, um, it, you know, there are so many leadership theories, change theories. I think what's important is to be intentional. And I think that that's going to be my takeaway from today's conversation is um, to try to step outside of any fixed mindset or fixed ideology um, uh, as a leader to step away from assumption about shared understanding of experience and communicate with a driving sense of purpose, as Curtis shared, um, and to allow for a diversity of context, a diversity of experience that will allow for these, these shifts that a team needs to make in order to adapt uh, and, and, and really prosper through change. And so uh, I think that a, a program like that one could certainly do, uh, do that as long as you're creating a conversation and there's a structure and a cadence for that conversation. Uh, organizations can can thrive. And so to me, it's less important which platform you're using, and it's more important to create the space. Um, I learned earlier this week uh, to create a brave space rather than a safe space. And I'll, I'll end today's conversation with that, um, this idea about uh, creating a brave space where we can step up and move outside of the narrow or fixed way of thinking that we may enter a conversation with, be comfortable with being uncomfortable and challenge ourselves to listen through and learn through the experience and that shared experience in that space. And so today, as I hand the mic back over to Brian to wrap things up, I'll thank everybody for creating this brave space, uh, for stepping in to the conversation with us. Thank you for joining us and Brian back to you. Thank you, Kelly, and a great way to end off the session, creating a brave space and stepping up. Um, well, again, thank you to the panelists for taking time out of your day to really come out and speak to our audience. It was a great and such an insightful conversation. I will be dropping the feedback form into the link th below. The session again will be recorded and then sent out via email as well as our next business fights in April. So look out for that. Uh, we'll be posting it very soon. Uh, very excited and then soon uh, we'll see all of you again. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.